So before my father passed away, I asked him to write down his memories of his time in Italy during the war. And this is a, a family heirloom. It's uh, Dante's Divina Commedia, Divine Comedy. And you'll see all of the cousins from Italy's uh, signatures, because when they came to the States, they were, were missing them. And the reason this was so valuable and important was during the war in Italy, when they were under horrible situations without food and just living day to day, they would read to each other Dante's Divinia Commedia at night around a fire. And as you know, in the Divin Divine Comedy, it starts off, I came to the middle of my life and found myself in a dark wood with no idea of which way to go. And they were going through their own dark night of the soul, as we all go through at different times and different places. So I want to read a little bit about my father's memories of World War II in Italy during that time. So my father's memories of the Second World War, while he was growing up, he was in his teenage years. And he, this is, this is one of his hats, so in honor of him, he's been gone two years now. So it's, so uh, these were his favorite kind of hats. And so I'm wearing this in honor of him as well. Francesco Di Maria. Um, I call him Babo. Babo is the affectionate term in the Tuscan dialect for daddy. And uh, this is his memories also of his Babo, which is my nono, which is uh, my grandfather. So on June 11th, 1940, Italy entered World War II. War was the distant then, and Babo, his father, kept us informed of the events through his daily newspaper. Things were quiet and distant for a couple of years. Then in the summer of 1942, we heard news of Uncle Attilio. This is my grandmother, my nonna's brother. He returned to Italy after a grueling seven days crossing the Sahara Desert on horseback. He commanded a small garrison of Arabs in the extreme southwestern corner of Libya. In the winter of that same year, his cousin, one with whom he had a close resemblance, Totono Pagano, was lost in the Russian campaign. We were told that the Italian troops were poorly clothed and unequipped for the rigors of the Russian winters. Many of the Italian soldiers died of cold and deprivation and not by enemy fire. The war was affecting us and getting closer. In the winter of 1942 and 1943, the British bombers began to hit us with long, spectacular night raids. We would wake up shivering at the tearing, screaming sound of the sirens. Babo would give each one of us a blanket and we'd go out in the fields. There we would settle in a ditch and watch the spectacle of the flares deployed by the British planes. The planes would circle around and, when over their target, would drop the bombs. The noise of the bombs dropping sounded like freight trains, but the target was a few miles away from us at the railroad bridge. The railroad was a critical link between North and Southern Italy. I must tell you that I was scared because whenever I heard the noise of the bombs, I'd hide my face in the bottom of the ditch and pray. My brother, Tony, on the other hand, would chatter away in exclamations of wonder at all the lights and explosions. In the summer of 1943, Sicily was invaded. That July, columns of German panzer tanks rolled down the roadway in front of our house. And when they made a turn, they ripped the asphalt pavement like it was fresh dirt. Their movement shook the hearth and the whole row of houses got worse. Their movements lasted days and nights. With the approach of the fall, things got even more difficult. I remember my mother concocting a kind of coffee cake made of sour gum, bird seed flour, which tasted horrible. We wash it down with a brew, which passed for coffee. It was made with oats expertly toasted by Babo and his coffee toaster. That is, in fact, another dear memory. When he toasted the real coffee in his toaster, the smell would wake the dead and all of us would have an early morning. As you may know, cafe latte is a popular Italian breakfast drink. 
As winter approached, Aunt Francesca and Uncle Roberto Bonamici came to live with us. Maybe they felt that Genoa would soon become involved in the war and they wanted to get further away. At any rate, they were heartbroken. They had three sons. The oldest was lost at sea. They had no news of the younger ones in the merchant marine. That was the bleakest, saddest Christmas in my memory. No heat, no lights, no decorations, no pastries, no sweets. In the spring of 1944, there was the landing of Anzio and at Monte Cassino. Rome was about to be liberated. The rest of Europe was in flames. Now the bombing became quite different. The American bombers came in, in the middle of the day at 30,000 feet. The roar of their engines could be heard before one could spot them. It was a rhythmic hum. Then we would hear the air raid siren and finally the sight of the planes. It was spectacular. The vapor trails of the bombers would describe a trail of straight lines like big sheet music in the sky, while the defending fighter planes would zigzag among the vapor trails like musical notes gone crazy. There was no time to admire the spectacle. One always had to seek shelter. Many times the squadrons of planes would pass over us and they would drop their deathly load over Florence or Pistoia. This we would know when we heard the rumble of the distant explosions, which would shake the hearth and the ground beneath us. To make things worse, the Germans moved in their anti-aircraft guns in the neighborhood and laid piles of shells every 30 or 40 yards along the road in front of our houses. The closest were 50 feet away from our house. Our guests had moved out by then to a safer location. We felt that it would be dangerous to be near our house during the daytime, so Babo would prepare a big pot of thick macaroni. So Babo would prepare a big pot of thick minestrone real early in the morning, and as soon as the sun was high in the sky, we would all take to the fields. We would take books to read, and lying in the shade of a tree or haystack, we'd eat our minestrone, which was deliciously lukewarm or sometimes cold. But there was no need to worry about tomorrow, so those were the peaceful days. On cloudy or rainy days, of course, there was no danger, and we stayed home catching up with our chores. Schools had been permanently closed a long time by then. One day, Aunt Virginia paid a surprise visit. She was visibly shaken and dirty. She had walked all the way from Florence to see us. Remember, there was no phones in those days, and being virtually under occupation, there was no mail either. As she was approaching our house, a fighter plane swooped down on the road with machine guns aflame. She quickly had a hidden a ditch on the side of the road. As she regained her composure, she told us that they had moved from their apartment in the vicinity of Florence, the second railroad station. This was the Campo de Marte station. The station handled a great amount of freight and became the target of a lot of bombing at the time. As a consequence, the residential area around it had become deserted. As a consequence, the residential area around it had become deserted. At the same time along the road where our house was located, the strafing had become a daily occurrence. The road was an important link between the north and the south, and it was con under continuous surveillance by the air. There was a small distillery near us, half a mile away, I reckon. One of those low flying planes decided to drop a bomb on the distillery. The explosion made an awful noise, shattering our skylight and some of the windows in our home. The bomb missed the distillery and hit the grocery store right next door to us, killing the grocer and his entire family. Babo ran over to see how he could help, but we boys were held prisoner by a hysterical mother who would not let us out of her sight. It was then apparent that life along the road had become impossible. In June, Tony reached his 18th birthday and was liable for military service. The Italian military force was no longer and the new recruits were herded in freight cars and packed to Germany. So of course, Tony was in hiding by my mother and father. We decided that it was time to leave our house and find refuge, but where would we go? The big air raids had now ceased and the railroads were in shambles and the apartment was vacated by the Fonoraros in Florence. Nobody in Florence would know where we were and the neighborhood was deserted. 
we agreed that that would be a good place to go. We loaded our tireless bicycles with some of our belongings and started on foot through the fields and country roads to avoid encounters with strafing planes and noisy German patrols. Once in Florence, I remember that we had no food to speak of but one precious 20 pound sack of dried split peas. There was no running water for cooking or drinking. We had to grab a pail and go down to a fountain located blocks away. In order to get there, one had to cross two streets running north and south. However, there were snipers located there and we would have to make a mad dash across the street. Babo would take as many turns as he could by himself, but all of us children had to help and with our hearts and our throats, we'd make a mad dash. Babo would also join the sad convoys that carried the wounded on stretchers to the hospitals. The slow moving file would carry banners made from bed sheets and large red crosses painted on them. The allied troops took their good old time in crossing the Arno River. All the bridges had been destroyed except for the Ponte Vecchio, which had a great pile of rubble on either side blocking access to it. We sensed that time was getting short and that there would be soon house to house combat. So we decided one last move. We would all converge on my grandfather's office located in the center of the old town of Florence. Because of the great historical value of the center of Florence had been declared a safe area where no combat or bombing would take place. My grandfather and extended family were there already. We all slept on the floor or on wooden benches. Pablo somehow got hold of fresh string beans and tomatoes. He cooked them on the burners used for assaying gold, and the resulting dish looked very appetizing. However, he made a horrible mistake. He asked me to carry the hot tray to the table, and the entire family was there waiting, sitting at an impoverished, improvised dinner table with forks in hand and mouths watering. In great triumph, I appeared from the laboratory with the tray clutched in both hands, and then I stumbled. <laughs> and all the delicious food fell on the floor. I didn't hear about the end of that from my aunts or uncles for a long time. We stayed in the office for a while longer to make sure that the street fighting had stopped. A one-page newspaper had appeared and it announced that figs were available in the hills on the south of the River Arno. Naturally, to redeem myself, I volunteered for the long trip. I started out on foot bright and early in the next morning. I walked and I walked, Bagno di Ripoli, Scandici, Pande Gilieri. Finally, I located a farmer willing to sell some figs. I bought all that I could carry, probably 10 pounds, and started on my long trip home. It was a beautiful day, not too hot, and I was getting really hungry. I figured that if I ate one fig or two, it wouldn't do any harm. When I got back, nine hungry people were waiting to feast on figs. <laughs> Guess what? There are only two pounds left. It takes a violent war to make people civilized. I only got hateful looks and unforgiving cold shoulders for a long time. I consoled myself by thinking that finally, for the first time in a long night, I went to sleep with a full belly. It was now late August, 1944, and the Allied troops were all over Florence. And we were all moved back to my grandfather's house near the Campo de Marte station. Babo was a changed man. He would stop and chat with the soldiers, moving his arms and hands with expressive gestures, just like an Italian, but the language he spoke was just a bunch of sounds. Was this my father? See, my father, my grandfather had come to the United States uh, back in the early part of the century and spent 20 years here with the general store in Maine before he went back. And he'd always planned to come back to the States, but then the depression hit and then Mussolini took over and he was stuck for another 20 years in Italy. And so all of a sudden when the uh, allied soldiers came in, my father didn't even know he spoke uh, English and he didn't know about his father's years in the US. And uh, he said one of the first things he remember hearing was his father speaking to some American GIs, um, helping them find their way through uh, the invasion. 
Immediately, Babo got a pretty important job as an interpreter. I remember inside the Palazzo Vecchio, the old palace, a big crowd was moving around as the American generals were holding court. The dispute had to do with the dismarmament of a contingent of partisans. These were the underground patriots that helped liberate Florence, who had earned high marks in helping the Allied advance. There were two interpreters, a pink cheeked handsome, tall American officer who translated the general's words into Italian. He sounded just like a printed book. The other interpreter was my father. He translated the partisan's appeal into English. He was short, bald, and poorly dressed, but oh, he was in his element. With shining eyes and high-pitched voice, he was doing his best to communicate the facts. At least I thought so as much. After the great tempest that shook the world, Babo came back on his own and into his own. He was reborn, and I was his secretary. Things were never going to be the same again. Babu took a room in a boarding house and stayed in Florence. We hitched a ride on some horse-drawn carriages, and we were jubilant to return to our house. I remember looking at myself and thinking I had never been so skinny. Our first thing as we got back was to cook spaghetti with tomato sauce, but there wasn't any oil. There was some linseed oil in a lamp and my mama used for cooking. It was the best red paint tasting spaghetti I ever had. At night, that lamp full of linseed oil smoked like a stovepipe. Slowly, our life became more normal. A British regiment of Goldstream guards moved in the town, and Babo, finding a job with these troops, came back to live at home. Gone were the camels and lucky strikes, and now we had corporal and player cigarettes. I remember being fascinated by the precise drills and marches being staged by those proud troops at the Piazza del Duomo in Prato. At our house, we billeted soldiers who occupied our bedrooms while the rest of us slept all together in one bedroom. We'd established a strong bond with these soldiers, and when they got orders to leave, it was a very sad separation because we knew they were going north to the Gothic line where the Germans were staging their one last hard and desperate resistance. Babo, all the while, had an office job at the British headquarters. I'm happy to have some pictures of him working there, as you can see on the next page, with him and three of his secretaries and various staff officers. The fall and winter, packed fa the fall and winter passed for us in some normalcy. We boys began our school year in September. Tony was in his last year of study, and I, having decided that I wanted to continue to go to university, switched school and enrolled in the Liceo Scientifico. This is the equivalent of a prep school. Spring came with a burst and promise, and on March 7, 1945, the armistice was signed, and we were finally at peace. On August 7th, Babo and I were briskly walking down the wide tree-lined boulevard that led to the railroad station. The morning was breezy, but the rising sun was promising another hot, dry day. We just passed by a newsstand where we read the headlines. An atomic bomb had been dropped on Hiroshima. We sat silently for a few minutes, thinking about this earth-shaking development. Then Baba wondered aloud, is this the end of civilization? I, being the eternal optimist, tried to put the genie back in the bottle. Oh, you see, Dad, the reverse of fission is fusion. And without doubt, the American scientists are already at work developing an antidote that will eliminate the danger of this terrible weapon. He looked at me with this clear gray eyes and said nothing in response. But I'm sure he was thinking, I know nothing about this stuff, but my son's little knowledge is worse than complete ignorance. <laughs> that fall, I went back to school and I began preparing to skip the last year of Liceo and take examinations for completion in October. We were now openly talking about the possibility of coming to America. Mama and Babo had made several trips to Florence, and during their discussions, I remember taking a look at the precious document that looked like an oversized dollar bill, the American Certificate of Naturalization Babo had. Babo explained that since he had been out of the country for more than five years and had not participated in the national elections since he had left America, he no longer enjoyed the privilege of an American citizen. However, the American Council in Florence had given him hope that perhaps because of his exemplary service as an interpreter, he'd be favorably considered for reinstatement of American citizenship.
One fabled day, we all took the train to Florence and went to the American consulate. The American flag flew on top of the majestic entrance of the Renaissance building. We were ushered into a beautiful paneled office. We faced a massive desk flanked by American flags. A tall, handsome, distinguished gentleman entered from a side door and intoned, raise your right hand and repeat after me. My father was sworn in as a citizen and we three boys, by virtue of this, were suddenly now American citizens. We were speechless and left the consulate in a daze, wondering about what our future held and what wondrous things might be in front of us. My mother's family, the Fonoraros, were not so happy about the prospect of seeing us leave the country. And for many years afterwards, we still wondered if we made the correct decision. But one half century later, as I think of all of you, sons, nephews, nieces, and grandchildren, <laughs> and all the beautiful American families you've created, my heart fills with joy. And I thank God for giving me such a wonderful and great Thank you for listening. Uh, you might think we have it hard some days uh, here in the first world. And I know there's a lot going on in the world right now that's challenging for all of us. But I came across this the other day and I had forgotten about it. And uh, I just felt such a desire to share it with our family and for anyone else who might find it of value in terms of courage and inspiration in the face of what seems like impossible odds. Living not knowing if you're going to live or die day after day. After my father wrote this and shared it with me, I said, Dad, you know, I'm so sorry, I can't imagine. I mean, this were your teenage years. You know, this this was your, supposed to be, you know, our best years. I said, Michael, you know, I don't tell many people this, but um, that wasn't the case. He said, I rarely live more fully. He said, the compassion that we all showed each other not just our family, but neighbors. And, uh, you know, he had a friend who he saw killed in mortar fire. And he said, we lived so fully and every moment of every day was a blessing. And, uh, you know, my father was so resilient and he could be a hard ass. But it reminds me, you know, he had severe trauma that wasn't all healed and resolved, but he also had a tremendous capacity for a love of life and the love of just the simple things like a tree, sound of a bird, the feel of breeze. And I can honestly say that was the uh, greatest gift he gave me was the love of life itself and no matter what is happening to never give up to never never give up so i thank god for giving me a wonderful love thank you